Good morning, everyone. Good morning, buenos dias. Um, I have a couple of quick announcements and then we'll get right into the keynote address. Um, my name is Megan Hastings. I am the Assistant Director for the Center for Latin American Studies here at Ohio State University. Uh, we are very excited to have you all here today. Uh, I'm very excited that Dr. Daniel Everett will be delivering uh, this morning's keynote address. Um, I did want to mention a couple of things about the program. Uh, we will have students at the registration table all day to help direct you um, where you need to go. But today we have a fairly standard day of presentations. Uh, you will have an open lunch for an hour and a half. There is a restaurant guide in your folders that you received in your packets that has a list of restaurants close to the area where you can go for lunch. Um, tonight we will be showing a private film screening of Wiñay Pacha, which is the first Peruvian filmed, a uh, Peruvian film filmed entirely in Aymara. And so we welcome you to join us for that. Um, that is free to all registrants and attendees of, this, of the symposium. So I will have tickets waiting for you at the Gateway Film Center. Um, that is just a few blocks south of the Ohio Union here on High Street. Um, again, we will have student volunteers walking everyone over to the Gateway Film Center for the showing tonight if you would like to come with one of us. I also wanted to mention that um, one of our keynotes for Sunday, Gaspar Pedro Gonzalez, uh, will present his latest book, La Mezcla de los Colores. Um, it's an experimental novel which addresses discrimination. Um, the presenter will be Professor Juan Guillermo Sanchez from the University of North Carolina, Ash Asheville. Um, and later, Gaspar will also read his poetry in Canjobal with English and Spanish translations. Um, this uh, particular presentation will be taking place today in the Tanya Hartman room of the Ohio Union, which is right down to your right, from 2 to 3 o'clock p.m. Um, that is listed briefly in your schedule, but we wanted to provide some additional details on that. Um, if you have any questions about the program, uh, please come find me or one of the students at the registration desk. Um, and finally, um, we had planned to have Dr. Brian Joseph here this morning to introduce our keynote speaker, um, but unfortunately his plane arrived during the night um, from Europe and he is unable to join us. So instead we have asked one of our graduate students, Justin Pinta, who is a graduate student in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and is familiar with Dr. Everett's work, to come up and do the in introduction this morning. Justin, you're welcome to go ahead and come on up. Thank you and enjoy the keynote. Thank you very much, Megan. Um, good morning to everyone. Buen dia, mi mainalia. Um, it's a pleasure to see everyone here, and welcome to the first full day of, of ILCLA. Um, as Megan said, I'm not um, <laughs> Brian Joseph, but um, I am a PhD student here in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. And um, yeah, so enough about me. Um, as far as Dan Everett is concerned, he's a linguist focused on understanding how cultural values constrain language, um, incorporating the tradition of William James, He's conducted extensive field research throughout jungle villages and has worked um, famously closely with the Piraha in, in Brazil. And he completed his SCD in linguistics from the University of Campinas. Um, over the years, he's taught at several universities on both sides of the Atlantic, um, the University of Pittsburgh, the University of Manchester, ISU in Central Illinois. And he's currently the Dean of Arts and Sciences at Bentley University in Massachusetts. Um, yeah, Dan's work has profoundly impacted me ever since I've first become you know, exposed to it whenever I, my very first semester of graduate school when I was doing a master's degree at university, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, I read his book, um, Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes, which actually affected me more personally than it did even academically. And then one of his later books, uh, Language, the Cultural Tool, which I read years later, um, affected me, very much affected the way that I see language and, and the way that it interacts with culture. So, um, yeah, basically uh, enough for me. Um, it, is, it is my sincere honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Daniel Everett. We're very happy to have him here. Muchas gracias. Yo no, va, no voy a hablar en español porque hace mucho tiempo que no hablo español, entonces va a salir mu uh, mucho portugués. Uh, <coughs> Falo português, mas uh, então, se, então se vocês quiserem depois me perguntar em espanhol ou português, podem perguntar. A pai te isso, o pai te isso, o pai, e aí te é que eu, a pai, hai. Se quiser, if you want to ask me in Peter High, you can do that too. Um, <coughs> or in English. Um, I'll stick with English, but uh, at the end, 
uh, for questions, feel free to ask me in any of those three languages. <clears throat> I heard some beautiful glottal stops uh, this morning, um, which I take it are probably from near where one of the places I'm going to talk to you about. Um, <clears throat> but let's move along. And some of you will already know why the grave of Frederick the Great is covered in potatoes, but if you don't, you'll know that at the end. So the abstract is Latin American indigenous languages and cultures have altered our understanding of our species and how it copes with the common problems of human survival. They bring to us foods, philosophies, languages, and concepts of diversity that are unique and profound. My focus in this talk is life and learning among Latin American indigenous peoples, focusing on my work among various indigenous societies of Brazil. I will argue that culture is far richer than often believed and that environment cannot explain values or languages. Latin American societies have produced profound cognitive innovations that should be more widely known. Uh, just give you a couple of quick examples. For example, um, uh, all chili peppers in the world, whether they're Hungarian paprika or Chinese Sichuan peppers, come from the Americas. Uh, one of the great in contributions. Uh, one of my early experiences uh, was climbing this pyramid with my 12-year-old daughter in uh, Mexico many years ago. Um, my son, who's the uh, head of anthropology at the University of Miami in Florida, has also explored a lot of uh, Latin American uh, regions, such as uh, Machu Picchu. He grew up in a Pitaha village. We'll hear more about that later. Uh, this beautiful pottery from the uh, island of Marajo at the mouth of the Amazon uh, may be the earliest civilization of all of Latin America, all of South America. Um, there are, there are some who argue that the Incas borrowed a lot from Marajoara culture. Others don't believe that. It's controversial. But one thing we know for sure, they had a thriving culture at this little island at the mouth of the Amazon, which is bigger than Switzerland. Uh, and then, of course, uh, as Charles Mann points out in his book, 1491, uh, uh, corn may be the most important invention in the history of our species. I would actually say language is the most important invention, but corn is one of the most important inventions, and it's, it's likely that this was invented, not simply cultivated by the Mayans, um, and uh, because its history comes from three inedible grasses. Um, and another thing that he points out in that book that I'm sure most of us know is that the ancient civilizations of Mesoamerica are probably as old, maybe even older, than the civilizations of Sumeria and Babylon. Uh, so uh, it is possible that uh, civilization, as we know it today, actually began in Mesoamerica and not in the Middle East. Uh, another food, the most widely consumed food in the world today, is cassava. Mandioca uh, originates in the Amazon, uh, brought to us by uh, Arawak-speaking Indians. So why do we study other people? Why do we study these, these groups? I mean, it's one thing if you are a Latin American uh, uh, indigenous uh, person and you study your own people, but why do uh, gringos like me go study uh, these, these people? Um, diversity is vital for the survival of our species. Without diversity in uh, gender and, and uh, uh, diversity in, in, in ethnic background, uh, we don't survive as well as a species. Uh, it's also important to understand others for our quality of life. We find when we study other peoples, new solutions to old problems. Everyone, there is, it is true that in some sense everyone has to s deal with the basic problems of food, clothing, and shelter. Um, and they deal with it very differently. And some of the ways that are dealt with it, th that these problems are addressed, are completely outside of our normal expectations and understanding whatever culture we come from. So learning about others and how they live um, requires profound field experience um, or uh, native speaker background. And these are some of the most vital lessons uh, for us as human beings today. Um, we learn about new values, new knowledge networks, social roles and organization. I used to walk in the Amazon with the Pinaha in the jungle and they would ask me in Pinaham, I, well, I would ask them, what do you call this in your language? And they would tell me, and I would write it down. And they said, what do you call it in your language? Tree. What do you call that over there? Tree. And this? Tree. They said, you just have one word for all of these things? 
because they know everything by its species name and their species classification. So they, they consider English fairly impoverished, and they consider me so inept that they wonder how I survive. Um, language, we also learn a lot more about language. So how have we been altered? What are some examples of alteration? Latin American indigenous languages have altered our understanding of our species and how it copes with common problems of human survival. They have done this by teaching us more about culture, language, and the unconscious in both the non-Freudian and the Freudian senses. Uh, my, one of my uh, newer books, the 2016 book, is Dark Matter of the Mind, and which came out of my, all my work comes out of uh, the study of indigenous languages of Latin America. Dark matter of the mind is any knowledge how or any knowledge that that is unspoken in normal circumstances. So in this book, uh, I came up with this idea when I, I realized that as an evangelical missionary in the Amazon, the Bible was not resonating well with uh, indigenous peoples. Um, I'll talk more about that. Um, the nature of language. Um, Studying Latin American indigenous languages has led me to the conclusion that I've explored in several books that whereas communication, which all species have, is the transmission of information, language is the transmission of information via symbols. And studying the symbols or the semiotics of different groups leads to tremendous insights, not only about language as it's spoken today, but about the evolution of language. Um, so I, I argue in, in my last book, How Language Began, that it's a human invention, which doesn't mean that one person sat down and made it up. Inventions are technologies that emerge from entire cultures. Um, and this emerged uh, through the symbolism and the rich culture of Homo erectus. And if I were giving a talk on Homo erectus, I would try to let you know how rich their culture was. So one of my favorite anthropologists, not because I like his work, there, a lot of it I actually don't like, uh, but I admire him so tremendously as a person, and his experiences were so close to mine in many ways, although much less time in the field uh, he had. Uh, the, it is only through difference that progress can be made. What threatens us right now is probably what we may call over-communication, that is, the tendency to know exactly in one point of the world what is going on in all other parts of the world. In order for a culture to be really itself and to produce something, the culture and its members must be convinced of their originality and even to some extent of their superiority of the others. It is only under conditions of undercommunication that it can produce anything. We are now threatened with the prospect of our being only consumers, able to consume anything from any point in the world and from any culture, but of losing all originality. And uh, that's one of the statements of Levi-Strauss I, I do actually agree with quite strongly. So this is Levi-Strauss in the 40s, working one river away from where I spent most of my adult life. This is the Marmelos River. I lived on the Marmelos for a while as well, but the Pitaha mainly live on a tributary of the Marmelos called the Mycee. And um, uh, he lived there not, not very long, just a few weeks, but he, he's written books that have captured the imagination, and there's no coincidence that through these rich experiences he became uh, France's leading intellectual, even above uh, Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, who was his uh, classmate, um, the, the leading intellectual prince. So my own work has been informed by studying indigenous uh, languages in various places. I got interested in linguistics, perhaps as many of, of you, by growing up and hearing different languages. I grew up on the Mexican border with California. You could see, Cal you could see Mexicali from my front door, and uh, our family doctor was in Mexico, and all of our, you know, my aunt worked in Mexico, and instead of coming from Mexico to work in the U.S., she went from the U.S. to work in Mexico every day. And uh, all of my friends, 70% uh, in my school were Spanish speakers. Um, and um, so this, I really became interested in language as a result of this. So over the years, I've written several books inspired by this. This is a, a sample. and. Uh, the blue one is a 540-page grammar of another language, Wadi, uh, that I worked with, uh, and then uh, how to do field work. But all of these have come, uh, whatever insights have come from different groups. So, so some of the groups I've worked with include the Suya, the Kinseji people, uh, who were studied, their music was studied by uh, Anthony Seeger, the nephew of Pete Seeger, the folk singer, and um, um, the Suya have an amazingly 
uh, intricate musical system with different melodies, different rhythms that reflect different rituals and different uh, uh, practices in the society. And they taught me a lot about organization and politics. Uh, when I asked permission from them to go there, this is the meeting they had to discuss whether they would give me permission or not with the chief, uh, Kuyusi, sitting with his back towards us there talking to the others. And uh, so this was a constantly negotiated and renegotiated uh, arrangement that we had uh, working there. Um, and s some of the Suya people. Um, uh, he, it's funny, he gave, uh, Kuyusi gave a lecture to my team before we went in there. He said, you're welcome here. You will see nudity. We don't want you to be nude because it means something different to you than it means to us. We don't want to see naked white people. And he said, uh, we don't want you having sex with any of our people because you're not part of our people, and we don't like that. So stay away from our people. Just be anthropologists. Uh, pretty good advice. Uh, the people in my, uh, my team uh, didn't need that advice, I don't think, but it was useful to hear it. Uh, the other group, my first uh, uh, prolonged experience was five, uh, part of my training, uh, five uh, months with the Celtales and uh, learning about uh, the culture of corn and maize and um, learning something about the Celtal people. Uh, and, and this really convinced me that I, was, I wanted to spend my life studying other peoples. Uh, this was part of my training to be a missionary, to live among the Celtals for five months. Um, and uh, once again, what I realized was that the transformation in me was far greater than the transformation any, in anyone else around me because uh, I was far more ignorant than I realized. And they helped me understand uh, the profound uh, ignorance of people. I remember that I went to a party among the uh, among the Celtal men, a festa, and uh, something like this. And they set me at the table and gave me this bowl of ool, which some of you will know what that is. And I drank it, and I, I really didn't like it, but I was, I was a young, um, I was trying to fit my way in. So they said, did you like that? And I said, I loved it. It was great. So they brought me a big bowl, and uh, I drank that. And uh, that didn't work too well for the rest of the night. but. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was a wonderful uh, experience. Then the Madi people uh, of, of the Amazon, uh, another people that I've spent uh, months with. Uh, and this is a typical Madi village. The little house in the foreground is for girls going through puberty. They're, they spend several months in this house, and they're not allowed to see anybody from the outside. Uh, some women are allowed in, particularly their mothers. But they're not allowed out until there's, there's a huge... Uh, party to recognize them as, um, as adults. Um, and the Madi are interesting technologically because uh, there are three, base, three main languages associated with the Madi, but they all make blowguns, uh, which they use uh, strychnine vine to make the poison. Um, and uh, this little boy, this is cultural transmission in action here as uh, the boy learns how to make. Uh, these are some of the, the folks that I hung around with there. Um, so I want to go now to the Pitahas and start to get into some of, of, of the other lessons. The Pitaha lived in the village for uh, a total of about eight years, over a period of 30 years. Uh, the longest stay I had at one time was uh, over a year um, with no radio, no contact with the outside world. So uh, that's when my family and I learned uh, Pitaha, uh, to speak it uh, every day. Um, and uh, they always enjoyed uh, uh, time with me. He's joking to me now about how I'm probably going to get eaten at any second by something in the river. Uh, and uh, Pitaha are uh, hunter-gatherers. They're one of the last surviving groups of hunter-gatherers in the world. Uh, they do make some homes. This is about as elaborate as they make it. Um, the Amazon climate is, is basically perfect if you're a human being. Uh, you need very little clothes. Uh, food is abundant. Uh, and and uh, there are some imported diseases like malaria, which originated in Africa and was imported to uh, in the common cold. But other than this, uh, uh, it's it's a wonderful place to be. The Pitahas culture has changed very little over the last 300 years. This is a photo from about um, 
40 years ago. I'll show you another photo almost identical from about two or three years ago. The first contact with the Pinaha by outside by Europeans was in 1784, and the brief description of them would describe them just as accurately today. They have resisted all attempts at people to teach them Portuguese, to change their lives. Uh, they are hunter-gatherers, and they have a very strong, robust culture. Um, this is me uh, doing what I did all day. I, uh, uh, anyone who studies another culture realizes that it's extremely hard work. I remember a Brazilian uh, river trader came up one time and after I'd been there for about a year, and he asked the Piraha in broken Portuguese. There's a sort of pidgin Portuguese they use, which is ironically, they, the Brazilians think they're speaking Piraha. The Piraha think they're speaking Portuguese, but most of the words come from an, an, the lingua geral, Nyengatu, which was a trade language spoken in that area over a century ago. There are still some speakers of it, but not as a trade language. And um, so the Brazilian asked the Piraha, how did Dan learn Portuguese, uh, learn Piraha so fast? And they said, well, he just sits, in his butt, sits on his butt all day. And then he stands up speaking. Um, so uh, this is the way I spent most of my days for eight years, uh, although I did, I did other things. Uh, this, this photo was taken about uh, two years ago. Uh, so they, they're still uh, fairly similar. Uh, they may... There are villages of Pinaha that wear no clothes. There are villages where s the women wear clothes and the men don't. There are villages where they use loincloths, villages where they've gotten Western goods through trade or through me, and they dress differently. A typical Pinaha and his father, and um, a, a Pinaha mother with her children. As I say, my children went with me um, uh, from the very beginning. My son was nine months old when we arrived in the jungle in the Amazon. And uh, he adapted fairly well. This is the chair of anthropology at the University of Miami uh, learning uh, about anthropology. And my daughters learned very early on how to make uh, uh, farinha uh, de mandioca uh, with Pinaha uh, girls. And uh, uh, they formed lasting bonds um, that whenever they're able to get back to the Pinaha, uh, their old friends uh, do greet them. So here's another statement of Levi Strauss that I agree with. Um, I am the place in which something has occurred. We sometimes think that we're going as objective scientists or uh, as non-objective missionaries to these areas. And uh, something happens in us that if we work really hard, we can communicate a little bit of to the public in science or in other books. We tell stories about our experiences. I mean, that's what anthropologists do, right? Anthropologists tell stories about cultures, and linguists tell stories about languages. They're the best stories we can tell, and we have ways of checking our stories, but there's still stories, and other people would tell different stories. And what these stories reflect more than anything else is our personal experience and how we were shaped and changed by the people we studied. So. Um, when I was uh, in my teens, I was, uh, I was an atheist. Um, and then I met a Christian missionary family, and uh, I became an evangelical missionary to Brazil. And I was an evangelical missionary for uh, quite some time. Um, the Peter High used to come to me, and they would say, <clears throat> uh, Dan, did Jesus look like us, or did he look like you? Well, you know, some people say that uh, he looked like me. Other people say he looked like you. He said, yeah, but you've seen him, so what did he look like? I said, well, I never saw him, but your father saw him. No, my father never saw him either. Who, who do you know that saw him? Well, I don't know anybody who saw him. So why are you telling us about him? The Pinaha have a very strong evidentiary burden that they place on claims from the outside, they're the opposite of superstitious. Uh, they're very empirical. And I would, if I were to talk about their philosophy in more detail, I would try to convince you that they're nominalists in, this, in the tradition of David Hume. Um, but they, um, as they began to think, as they began to ask me these questions about where my evidence came from, I realized that uh, I didn't really have good evidence, except 
And, and then I realized, what, am I, what, what would be the result I'm after if they were to convert to Christianity? And I realized they're already less superstitious and, more, and happier and better adapted than any Christian I know. So I realized not only did I not have any evidence, I had no offer. And this led to a, a, an accelerated process of deconversion on my part to becoming an atheist. Um, and uh, I am an atheist. I'm not an evangelical atheist, uh, as some are, like Richard Dawkins, but I am an atheist. Uh, and uh, the Pinaha were extremely helpful to me in, in reaching those conclusions. So to go through just some of the things we've learned from the Pinaha, uh, religion. The Pinaha is the only group I know of that have, uh, in, as they're studied in their culture without influence from the outside, they have no concept of God. There's nobody who created the world. I remember asking a person, a Pitaha guy, he said, um, who created the trees? He said, what do you mean? I said, you know, there were no trees, and we say God made the trees. He said, have you ever seen the world without trees? No. Why do you mean who made them? They've always been here. Um, so they never found any real use for God. Another thing is the Pitaha don't tell each other what to do. So the idea that there's Ten Commandments where somebody else is telling you what to do also doesn't make much sense to them. In fact, in Dark Matter of the Mind, I list several pages of their cultural values contrasted with my cultural values and why communication really wasn't going to be possible on this particular subject. They also have the kin simplest kinship system known. Uh, they have a word for the generation above, which is big. You have big big person, you're the generation above. It's sort of like what we do in uh, English. Uh, we have grandparent, which means big parent, and then we have great grandparent, which means big, big parent. Um, so English kinship system's not that complicated either. Most of the technical terms we have in English we borrowed from French. Um, so they have a very simple, th this, this generation is a sibling, so they don't make a distinction between brother and sister, we're all siblings. Um, biological siblings use the same term as non-biological siblings. Everybody's a sibling if they're of the same generation. For children, uh, for the generation below, everyone is uh, gender neutral again, chio um, There, There are separate terms for biological son and biological daughter, but other than that, there are three terms for the kinship system. Um, fiction, people often ask me about Pitaha fiction, but one of the best lessons that I learned was that the fiction fact boundary is not a universal. It's not the same for everybody. Um, so my claim is that the Pinaha don't have any concept of fiction as we define it. They talk about entities that I don't think exist, that they think exist, much as Pentecostal Christians talk about seeing spirits and having uh, unusual spiritual experiences. But for them, it's just part of the continuum of life. They talk about dreams um, in the same way they talk about real experiences. They know they're dreaming, but when you dream and think of something, uh, that's also a valid experience that you had. That's teaching you something just like not dreaming is teaching you something. So a Peter Hahn might sit up at 3 in the morning and start telling everybody else in musical form um, that he is uh, what he dreamt. Um, so... Um, when this leads to the fact that uh, there are no creation myths among the Pinaha. There's no story of how they were created. There's also no origin myth, how they came to be where they're at today. These kinds of old stories, so the Pinaha don't talk about things that they didn't witness or that somebody alive at the time it happened didn't witness and tell them. Other than that, they don't talk about it. What's, what's the point? There's no taboo against talking about the dead in the Pinaha. But they don't talk about the dead because they're not here. They're not part of day-to-day -day life. Sometimes a Pinaha man will come in from the field or the jungle and say, I was thinking today about so-and-so. He was my brother, and now he's dead. But that's about all you hear, somebody they knew who died not, not too long ago. Uh, but they simply don't talk about things that range far out of their experience. Um, we'll see some other things about them later. I mean, they're the only group known that have no numbers whatsoever. They don't have even the number one. And this has been documented experiments 
uh, lots of publications on this fact. The group that doesn't. So how do they how do they divide up meat? How do they do these tasks that we often attribute to numbers? Uh, pretty easy, you know. You sit around in a circle and you take meat and pass it out until it's gone. That's a pretty good way of doing division without numbers. Uh, uh, so so numbers simply are not uh, part of their cultural values, um, and they're not things that they're really interested in. Um, Again, they, their culture has continued on strongly for about 300 years uh, with very little change. Um, we're starting to see a little bit more now because the Brazilian government has made uh, a lot of effort to get to change their culture, unfortunately. As you know, throughout Latin America, especially this happened in Brazil, um, when European uh, uh, government officials or representatives of European governments met indigenous groups, they wanted them to have a hierarchical society like they had in the old country. So they were always trying to find their chief or their cacique or whatever they called it. And uh, most of the time they didn't have such a thing. You know, it didn't make any sense in these cultures. Certainly don't, doesn't make any sense among the Pitaha. Um, and, and, uh, but the, the main reason they wanted to find these chiefs is to get people to sign away their land and give them rights to exploit the people. So. Uh, this still goes on today, even among groups that, you know, chief is sort of a created thing, but they have it now. Um, but um, culture is obviously shaped and, and affected by other cultures. Every culture is shaped and affected by other cultures. It's not unique to them. You know, they, they affect us as well. Um, in syntax, where I've done most of my writing, the results have been fairly revolutionary, in, in my opinion. They've shown us ways of organizing language that, that are considered to be impossible, especially by people who don't do field work. Um, and uh, uh, so, so one of the things about Peter Ha that we might have some time to talk about a little bit in a bit is that um, they tell intricate stories about the present, not about the past. And in those stories, you find ideas within ideas and sub-themes and themes and larger organizations and smaller organizations and stories within conversations. So they have all of the ability to organize their thinking recursively, for example, that we do. And uh, yet they choose not to use that in their s syntax, in their day-to-day -day grammar. Why is that? Well, there are many reasons for that. And one of them is if you're in a noisy environment uh, and you don't have a writing system saying short things, uh, has advantages over saying long things. In fact, we find out that uh, recursive structures are, are not exclusively found in written languages, but they're found very heavily in written forms. So if you read a novel, you're much more likely to find recursive structures than if you're in just a regular conversation with someone. Um, and and uh, so, although I don't think this should surprise us, it's been shocking to people who've uh, who have made certain claims about universals of language, um, uh, but who at the same time do not look at stories. If you look at Pinaha's stories, you know, for example, if Chomsky had followed his teacher, Zelig Harris, in studying discourses instead of studying sentences, this would not surprise him. These facts would not be surprising. Chomsky is best known for, for example, um, the, the, the grammatical operation called the transformation. Well, this tra the transformation was actually discovered by Zelig Harris, and Zell who, Chomsky's thesis advisor, and he discovered it by studying text. So he said, the active sentence, John saw Bill, has a different function in the text than the passive sentence, Bill was seen by John. And that's how he found them. And he said the transformation is the link between them. It's not like you took one and made it into the other. It's simply saying, if you have this sentence type, you may also have this sentence type, and their functions will be more or less of the following. Um, so some of the best insights into syntax have come from people who studied uh, discourse. And when we study indigenous languages, that's why I tell people, if you're going to study an indigenous language for the first time, once you have the permission of the people to work there, the first question I ask is, who's the best storyteller? Who tells the best stories? Sometimes they'll just give you blank stares, but other times they'll say, oh, you know, John over here, he tells some really good stories. That's who I want to work with. That's who I want to teach me about the language, because everything I get 
I want to get from conversations and stories. I'll, I'll get some things that I elicit in individual sentences, but the bulk of my data I want to come from stories and uh, conversations. Because that's language and it's cultural context and it's language in which all the gaps are filled in and which you can see the functions of the sentences you're studying and the sounds, the distribution of the sounds. Um, knowledge of the local environment. To go back to that example of where the Pinaha asked me about the word for tree, and that's not the only thing they've asked me about. Most of the things they ask me about animals, I, I don't have any idea. They'll tell me all about stars. And I keep thinking, I need to take, bring somebody down here who knows something about stars. I mean, the mo one of the most important lessons I've learned studying the Pinaha is how profoundly ignorant of the world I am. Uh, because the average Pinaha child knows the name of every animal, every tree. They know about their behavior. They know about the stars. They know how to find themselves. I often tell people, you know, that there's this popular U.S. television show, Survivor. Uh, you know, put a Pinaha in that group and the rest of them will be long gone before the Pinaha. A Pinaha man can walk naked into the jungle, which I've seen many times, and come back three days later with uh, uh, an entire uh, basket full of uh, food and a bow and arrow and all stuff that he made while he was out in the jungle. Um, uh, their knowledge of survival is uh, incredible. It's more than knowledge of survival. Um, the, the average hunter-gatherer, you may not realize this, maybe you do know it, um, spends about 15 to 20 hours a week working. And the rest, that's all you need to keep yourself. They have a better diet than agricultural societies, a more varied diet. Um, they, it requires less work to get it. Uh, and so what do they do? Well, they sit around talking and laughing and having fun. I mean, it sounds like a terrible life, right? Um, uh, you mean they don't have any ambition? Well, ambition is also a cultural value, which, no, they don't happen to share that individual ambition uh, idea. Uh, economics. What do we have to learn of economics from these people? I remember a... Um, an old man, he had fallen from a Brazil nut tree, which is about 150 feet, you know, maybe 50 meters, the tallest tree in the jungle. And uh, he broke almost every bone in his body. And we got him to the hospital, and when he came back, he wasn't quite right cognitively, and he didn't walk straight. He walked sort of crooked, you know. And um, he couldn't do this normal work that he used to do. So he, uh, he would get firewood, and not very much, because he couldn't carry very much. And the people would feed him uh, every night. And I asked a guy, I said, you don't mind giving him your food? You're giving him food every day? He didn't. He said, when I was a little boy, he put food in my mouth. And uh, he's an old man, and I put food in his mouth. That's how we do it. I asked the peanut how because they don't preserve meat. They don't salt meat. They don't smoke meat. I said, uh, what happens if you, uh, if you catch too many fish? They said, I keep my fish in the belly of my brother. Uh, I, I share my fish uh, with others. This is how we survive. Um, and there, there's a, some interesting economic lessons. They don't come straight from the Pitaha, but they do come from indigenous peoples around the world who uh, simply don't have uh, some of the attitudes that we find so basic in capitalist structures. So they, they have very different views of economy. So the Pitaha are basically uh, nominalist, anarchist, socialists. Um, I would never describe them that way because those are Western concepts. Uh, and it doesn't really get all the nuances of them. But if you were there just superficially, that's probably the conclusion you would come up with. Uh, so, so one of the things I've learned in uh, my field work, at least I think I've learned, is that a lot of the technical terminology of linguistics, even the International Phonetic Alphabet with its representation of all the sounds of the world's languages, uh, the categories we use in syntax, the categories we use in cultural anthropology, um, oftentimes these simply obscure what the languages have to teach us. Not every sound, if you take the letter P from the International Let uh, Phonetic Alphabet, it doesn't really describe how the Pinaha pronounce a P. Uh, so they'll say, Pei, Pei. So the, the lips are flattened all across the lips. So if I write the P in Pitaha in my early work, I annotate what does this mean in Pitaha because there's all this variation that's very important for them. Um, the same thing with different cultural rituals. You know, if you ask me, do they have uh, 
do they have totems and this sort of thing? See, I think that totems and some of the basic concepts of anthropology are misguided. I think we need to start with more basic building blocks such as values and uh, knowledge structures and social roles and then see what comes out of that. That's one reason I diverge from Levi Strauss's anthropology. I don't think there's anything innate and no structures that are found in all the languages or cultures of the world. Um, you can see why I'm so popular with people who do believe those things. Um, <clears throat> but the main lesson I learned from the Pitaha was contentment and happiness. There's a documentary about my time among the Pitaha produced by the Smithsonian Channel called The Grammar of Happiness. And uh, somebody said, did you come up with that title? And I said, no, that's not my title. It's just that um, I, I was talking about the language once, and one of the filmmakers said, maybe that's why they're so happy. So they used that title. But, um, but whatever the reason is, the Pinaha are content. And this doesn't mean they're silly or stupid people. They see people die. They face dangers. Somebody told me once, oh, well, they're happy and content because they don't have to face all the compli complexity of, a, of our societies. Well, that's silly. Uh, we have some add-ons in Western societies, but not every one of us gets up in the morning wondering if we're going to catch enough food for our family or whether we're going to get killed by an animal when we're out hunting. I would say those are fairly significant complexities in their life that could lead someone to worry, but they don't worry. Um, I've seen no evidence of worry. Sometimes they do, but, but usually they do not. Um, sexual mores are a different thing. You know, I said I came from a hippie background. When I first got to the Pitaha, before I'd really had any concept of their culture, my first impression was it was a hippie commune uh, where, uh, uh, you know, if it feels good, do it. Uh, everybody was happy to, you know, very, very liberal society in, in many respects. When I told the Pitahas that I was an atheist and that I, w I had divorced my first wife, um, you know, most of us practice a form, not most of us, many of us practice a form of marriage called serial monogamy, you know, where we're married, we have multiple partners, but they're not at the same time. Um, and that's sort of the way the Pitaha are too. So uh, they said, oh, you're really becoming a Pitaha now when I told them about this stuff. Um, so what are some of the lessons we learn? Organization of grammar. Uh, languages can talk about whatever they want to talk about. Um, and, uh, and yet, what does that mean? It means that the things that are active in their cultural value system can be talked about. Um, but things that are not active in their cultural value system can't be talked about. So for example, here's a sentence in English. John borrowed $10,000 from the bank of mom and dad to pay for college. The Pinaha don't have a word that distinguishes mother and father. There's just a word for parent. They don't have a word for 10,000 because they don't have a word for one. They don't have a word for money. They don't have a word for college. Um, they certainly don't have a word for bank. There's no way to express this in the language. Does that mean that if they had those experiences, they could express it? Um, still not without profound experience and actually alteration of the grammar itself. It's not just a matter of learning new words. Um, they have a very different conceptual scheme in which to embed new experiences. Religion, again, it's a culture without a notion of God. Numerical cognition, when I told people that the Pinaha didn't have uh, numbers, that brought several different psycholinguists and cognitive scientists down to the Amazon to carry out experiments. Um, so we did a series of experiments with uh, folks from Stanford, from uh, Columbia, from MIT, and Berkeley. Over the years, they didn't all come at once. And uh, at the end, they said, yeah, they don't have any numbers. Uh, this is really strange. But uh, uh, what was most interesting, and now we know of other groups that are, are pretty similar. And I also think that many of the groups in the world that are ha classified as having the system one, two, many, which is what I thought the Pitaha had initially, might also lack numbers. Numbers are a fairly recent cultural invention. My son Caleb's book, Numbers and the Making of Us, goes into the history of numbers across the world's cultures. and um, one of the pictures in the book is with, with him in Angkor Wat. Anybody have any idea why if you were writing a book on numbers, you would take a picture in Angkor Wat in Cambodia? Because the first written example we know of in world history of zero is on a hieroglyphic in Angkor Wat. Um, 
so uh, well, the, they didn't necessarily invent zero, but they're the first ones we have a record of writing it. And how did these numbers change uh, the course of human history? How did numbers change the course of human history? Um, kinship types, being more generous with classifying kin. Anybody who's studied anthropology knows that the more elaborate your kinship system, the tighter the controls on marriage. Um, so the Pinaha have a very loose kinship system. What do you think the controls are on finding partners? Fairly, fairly loose. Um, uh, resistant to assimilation. Um, they'll ask me things like, how do you say this in uh, Portuguese, you know, a table in Portuguese, Dan? I'll say, mesa, mena, man. That's really ugly. We don't, we don't talk like that. Um, so they ask me how to say it in English, and it's also really ugly. We don't talk like that. They're very ethnocentric, so you shouldn't get the idea that they're the perfect, open-minded people. They do it the right way, and we don't. So their name for themselves is Hiai Chehe, which means straight. They don't call themselves Piraha. That doesn't mean anything to them whatsoever. It's just a name Brazilians gave to them. Um, Hiai Chehe, uh, he is straight. And what are we? We are all Awe, uh, which is uh, bent, crooked. Uh, I had somebody, you know, Brazilian government employee in one time, and he said, poor things. They just, they live in this poverty. They have such a miserable life. He said, what do they think of me? I said, well, you're crooked. You know, you're an you're, you're inferior person. They think I'm inferior? I said, unfortunately, you know, that's what they think, you know. <laughs> Going back to Levi Strauss, we sometimes want to think of ourselves as superior. Um, I had another guy, for some reason, he wanted to bring his scuba diving outfit to the Amazon. And he, he, was, he was a very rotund person. And he, um, he been, was afraid to get into the water when he saw what was in it, you know. And, uh, but he wanted the Pitaha to see his scuba diving gear like this would impress them. And so he came out in all his scuba diving gear, and they started talking and laughing. And he said, so what are they saying? I said, they say you have breasts like a woman, <laughs> which was not what he expected to hear. They, they couldn't be less interested in his technology. They're not interested in my technology. You know? They always ask me about tape recorders and stuff. And yeah, we don't want those things. Or we would have built them. Um, so uh, grammar of happiness, um, the, these people changed my life. Um, and they are the reason, wh when you go as a researcher to any group, especially if it's a cross-cultural experience, um, you're the place where change is going to take. Some of you will be familiar with this book. It's, an, uh, it's a wonderful uh, encyclopedia of all the things the world has benefited from in American Indian North, Central, and South technology and contributions to the world, from corn to potatoes to cocaine and tobacco, uh, all the things. 55% of all the food consumed in the world today comes from American Indians, uh, invented by American Indians, chili peppers, corn, uh, which brings me to one of the most widely consumed foods in the world. Recently, I was giving a talk in Potsdam, Germany, where this palace is. It's the summer palace of Frederick the Great, Sans Souci. Um, and it's a beautiful palace. I ran up here. It's got miles of, of just gorgeous gardens all around that I could jog seven miles in the morning and not even cover half the park. Um, and then I found out that his grave was there, and I walked over to look at his grave. And this is the grave of Frederick the Great, and every day it's like this. People put potatoes on his grave. Why do they put potatoes on his grave? Because the potato transformed German culture. Um, it is as in many cultures, a staple food item. Uh, it certainly for the Germans is almost sacred. Frederick the Great was the one who introduced the potato into Germany. Uh, whether he knew or not that it was, an inv it was cultivated originally by uh, Peruvian uh, uh, Incas, uh, we don't know. But this is just one of the many contributions of the world. Um, Frederick the Great gets the credit for bringing it to uh, Germany, but uh, we all know better. But this potato, like corn and chili peppers and knowledge and changes in value, uh, Levi Strauss, uh, Levi Strauss's work changed the world of American anthrop of of world anthropology uh, by his study of, of Brazilian indigenous languages and cultures. I'll just close with um, one story. Uh, Levi Strauss, when he was about uh, 40 years old. Uh, was having, uh, he had spoken at Columbia University and he was having lunch with Franz Boas, who
who was uh, then almost 100. And at the end of their lunch, Franz Boas had a seizure and fell over backwards. And, and Levi Strauss got him up in his arms, and Franz Boas died in Levi Strauss's arms, which is a sort of interesting story. The, the founder of American anthropology dying in the arms of the founder of uh, French anthropology. Of course, Boas was a German from around the Potsdam area. Um, but um, I have studied uh, indigenous languages and cultures for 30 years so far, actually longer than that now. I, I guess the first, when I went to Seltals was 41 years ago, so it's, it's longer. Um, I've just submitted a proposal to start work on a new language that I've never studied before in northeastern Brazil, the Yate language, which is the only indigenous language still spoken in the north of Brazil in, in deserts by the beach. So I'm really looking forward to that as a change of pace. Um, but there's, there's really nothing more important we can do than to study people unlike ourselves. Not so much what we can do for them. I thought the Pitaha were all going to go to heaven because of me. And because of them, I don't even believe in heaven. Uh, uh, my life has been changed uh, forever. Um, uh, the work that I have done has, and others, many others, uh, but the work I've done through my experiences has, has changed the course of some thinking about language and about uh, culture. Uh, but it's only because of the tremendous privilege of working with people and, and being diverse. So uh, I, I often tell people this because I'm at a business university. Uh, if you're in the boardroom and you look around the table and everybody looks like you, you're in the wrong board people look like you, they're probably also going to think like you, and they're going to probably talk like you. Um, and, and that's what a lot of boards want. That's what a lot of governance is. That's what a lot of, um, a lot of science is. I mean, if everybody looks different, um, that's a real step in the right direction. Diversity is, is not just superficial. It's not just that we look different, but usually people's appearances reflect their backgrounds. And we want as variety, as varied a background as we can get to grow as human beings, to grow as scientists, to develop the best kind of um, business hierarchical organization. Sometimes having people who come from non-hierarchical cultures can provide us with entirely novel for us ways of looking at the world. So what I tried to do, and I'll take questions to the degree that there's time, is simply share for a general group of people um, a, a variety of lessons from the Pitaha that have occupied me and that I'm still thinking about uh, more than 40 years after I started uh, doing this kind of work. And I look forward to hearing from all of you uh, during the remainder of the conference your similar lessons, uh, some more focused and more uh, technical, but, um, uh, but hopefully no less uh, personal and transformative in your lives. Uh, thank you very much. Questions? Uh, they don't code switch into anything because they speak Pinaha and a little bit of this trade language, which they think is Portuguese. Um, as I tried to learn the language, even when I could utter entire sentences, they thought of me as sort of like a talking parrot because they didn't believe that you could learn the language without being culturally assimilated. I was eating a salad one time, and a Pinaha man came along, and he said, you're eating leaves. I said, yeah, I'm, uh, we, we like these. He said, well, that's why you don't speak Pitaha. We don't, we don't eat that stuff. Uh, you, you really need to assimilate to the culture and live in the culture. So um, no, there was no code switching. Certainly not for me, because I could barely, uh, you know, for the first uh, few weeks. So to so give you an example, you know, Pitaha is a tone language. So you ask them the word for uh, ear, awe, and the word for skin, awe, and the word for hand, awe and the word for uh, Brazil nutshell, awe, and the word for foreigner, awe. Um, those are all quite distinct words in the language. <laughs> 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 
And if you can't get the tones right, you can't speak the language. Um, and they can whistle their language, they can hum their language. So when I was really starting to speak it relatively well, they would switch to whistling. Um, and just talk about anything they wanted to talk about. And then they would hum. And, and they have various channels of discourse um, that also teach us a lot about language. Uh, what's salient? What's whistled? You know, these things teach us about the consonants and vowels. Why do they have the smallest number of vowels and consonants, one of the smallest numbers in the world? Eight consonants if you're a man, seven if you're a woman, and three vowels no matter, regardless of gender, um, because they have tones. And the consonants aren't even that important because they whistle the language and they hum the language. So uh, they code switch in the sense that they go back and forth between consonants, vowels, whistling, and humming. They do, will do that, especially if they don't want you to know exactly what you're, they're saying. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my, my um, ex-wife still lives there. Uh, trying to convert them. Um, and so from time to time, she sends me little videos of them talking to me. And I make a little video and send it back. Uh, satellite phones are amazing things. So we stay in contact. And yeah, if I go back there, my, I have a Peter Han name. My whole, everybody in my family has Peter Han names. Um, we would, I wouldn't say that we have a kinship relation because everybody has a kinship relation in Peter Han. It's pretty simple. But when I go back, yeah, I'm, I'm received like a long lost friend. They're all very happy to, uh, to see me. Um, and uh, as I'm happy to see them. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's family. I mean, I, you, I lived with them for many, many years. And uh, um, uh, they're probably the, the best friends I have based on, on those kinds of things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very good question. Um, as far as we can tell, Pinaha pronouns, they have three. Hi, third person. Chi, first person. And ni, second person. Um, now, the, the first person has two forms, chi and chi. Chi is used in ergative context and chi in absolutive context. Um, you don't want to say chi because that means excrement. Um, so, but it seems that these pronouns were actually borrowed from uh, the uh, local trade language, Nyingatu, uh, because those are exactly the pronouns of Nyingatu. Nyingatu has two systems of pronouns. These come from the uh, three system of Nyingatu pronouns. Um, they tend not to use many pronouns or even proper names. They use them, but they use them differently than we do. So we wouldn't say something like, John came in the room, then John sat down. We would say something like, John came in the room, then he sat down. We would use a pronoun there. Pitaha don't normally do that. They just say, John came in the room, John sat down, which in Pitaha would be something like, Ko oi he abo pai he abait pihai. Abait pihai. Actually, there I did use the pronoun, <laughs> come to think of it. Um, so, so often they use the proper names when we don't expect them to, and often they use the pronouns. And in long texts, they just omit everything, which we do in a lot of European languages as well. So in Spanish and Portuguese, you don't have the subject in every sentence. Um, you can say it's a zero subject or whatever you want, but there's nothing there you can hear that represents the subject. So the Pinaha do that as well, and that's been studied in discourse by a number of linguists over the years. So the pronominal system is not that, it's very simple. The verb system is very complicated. So how many verb forms are there in English? Five, sing, sang, sung, singing, sing. Pathetic little system up because English is a basically a pidgin language with 55% words from Latin and French and it almost died out in the 12th century and when it survived it lost all of its Germanic inflections and stuff. Um, but the, uh, and how many forms does a verb in Spanish have? You know, 40, 50, something like that. How many f verb forms does a, a Pinaha verb have? Roughly 65,000. Uh, there are 16 classes of suffixes uh, the suffixes don't even correspond to what we would think suffixes would do, so there's no tense. Um, uh, 
there's no past and present tense. That doesn't mean, by the way, that they don't know about past and present. Every Pinaha knows that yesterday is not today, even though they have no word for it. There's a word uh, that means other day, which could be yesterday or tomorrow. Uh, they just choose not to distinguish these things. It doesn't mean they can't think about them. This is something the press often gets wrong. Uh, the fact that you don't have a word for something doesn't mean you can't think about it. That's how uh, Murray Gell Mann, the physicist, discovered the quark. He discovered a particle there was no name for, and he gave it a name. Uh, we can often think beyond our language. Um, so um, their verbs are extremely complicated. And when you're working with them in a monolingual situation, I have no way to ask them in Portuguese what these things mean, right? So I'll, ask, I'll say, uh, you know, how do, I'll describe an action or, or ask them to describe an action, and they'll give me a verb maybe with seven syllables. And I ask them to say it again, and they'll give it to me maybe with three syllables. Uh, I say, well, what's the difference? They're just the same. They mean just the same. You know that's not true. They don't mean just the same, but they could be used. They, you have to look at the context to see in how, how they're distinguished. Um, so this kind of work is extremely dif difficult. Somebody asked me once, if a pitaha wrote a grammar of their own language, would they come to the same conclusions that you have? I doubt that very significantly. Uh, we each tell the best story we can tell based on what we have seen. Uh, I speak the language fairly well, but I'm not a native speaker. I don't have all the insights that a native speaker has. And unfortunately, in the meantime, the world will have to deal with what I've described. Um, and I've, I've done my best to be careful. But I look forward to the day, if any Pinaha is ever remotely interested in writing a grammar, about as much chance as the average Ohio State student uh, on the sidewalk wanting to write a grammar. Uh, why would you write a grammar? I mean, who cares about that? So uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's similar in the only in the sense that um, so for English, for example, doesn't have a future tense. A lot of people say John will go, but that's not a future tense. We have past John went, and we have present John goes, which is isn't actually a present, right? It's a habitual. Um, but um, there is no form of the verb to indicate the future. We have to use this paraphrastic construction that takes this modal particle will and John will go. Does that mean that English speakers can't think about the future? Uh, no, it doesn't mean that. We're all thinking about uh, November 6th, I think it is right now. So uh, um, yeah, we, the fact that you don't have the technical terminology doesn't mean you can't think about it. It just means you don't talk about it, which means it's not that important to you. There are no created uh, written texts. Um, they have stories. I record them, sometimes play it for them. But um, uh, they, they, we, we did every, they wanted to learn to read and write back in 1980 when I was there for the entire year. So I spent every night uh, making popcorn, which was a huge incentive to come. Uh, and uh, uh, they, were, they were learning to read and write and learning about mathematics. So I, I got them where they could read the sounds of their language, and I wrote the word, a word on the board, which I just took some black paint and painted a wall black, and I wrote on this board, and, and I said, what's this say? And they all said, Miggy, and they started laughing. I said, um, why are you laughing? That sounds just like our word for ground. I said, it is your word for ground. No, we don't write our language. Is that what you're doing? Yeah, uh, we don't want that. So they stopped coming. <laughs> they, they weren't interested in it. Um, which reminds me of another cultural lesson for the Pitaha. The, the word for ground is migi, and the word for sky is migi. Uh, so why would they have the same word for ground and sky? 
because they're natural barriers, and we occupy the space in between. Those are the boundaries of our experience. Um, not that profound, but sort of exciting to think about. I was really, when I, because when I first heard them, I thought, I must not be hearing a tone. There's something I'm not hearing right. And then I realized, no, I'm hearing it right. Those are just the same word. And the word for cloudy sky is mige e That's the phrase. And the word for muddy ground is mige e So it's wet barrier, whatever it is. So uh, different conceptions of the universe. Yes. Well, I would advise them first and foremost to uh, live at least a week with strangers in their neighborhood uh, to get a cross-cultural experience. Um, you know, if you live on the border of Mexico, it's easy to do. You can find a family maybe to put you up in Mexicali or Tijuana and go there and spend a week. But when I say that, I don't mean just as an observer. I mean living under their rules, doing things that, as they want you to do in, in their cultural context um, so when I, I find it amusing when, li when linguistics departments have field methods classes in which they bring in a bilingual informant who's a Western student and ask them about their language. Yeah, you're getting data there. Whether I would call that field work of any kind, I don't know. I mean, to me, field work is inserting yourself um, in, in a foreign culture, in a different environment, and learning. Because to me, you cannot learn the language. I remember doing, when I was doing my PhD at the Universidade de Estado de Campinas in Brazil, um, a Quechua man was doing his PhD there as well. And he was, he's, I said, what are you working on now? He says, I'm working on the verbs. He said, man, I don't know how anybody could describe Quechua verbs if they don't know Quechua culture. I just don't understand how you could get what all the suffixes mean if you didn't understand culture. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I first got to Brazil, I was watching a championship soccer match. Um, between the two best Brazilian teams. And um, the, the announcer said, Guarani está o melhor time e é o melhor time. It was two verbs to be that I didn't think you could use in the same sentence like that. And I realized that uh, there's a cultural difference there that reflects in how the verbs are used, uh, you know, currently the best team, and in fact, solidly, innately, inherently the best team. Um, so, you know, you see this with people learning languages all over the world. They study language in a classroom. They don't know anything about the, the cultural context, so they don't know how to use the language. They're just disembodied words. Um, and languages are more than disembodied words. Languages, uh, not to be too poetic here, I know they're going to be talked about poetry. Languages emerge from the, the culture. They are not isolated little formal codes like computer codes. There's, I, I When I was at uh, MIT as a visitor in 1984, the New York Times called my then friend uh, Noam Chomsky to interview him about a claim on a South American language. And he said, I don't know anything about South American languages, but Dan does, so why don't you talk to Dan? So I spoke to the New York Times, and they said, it's been claimed in a recent paper that Aymara is the perfect, is the only perfectly logical language in the world that could be used actually for computer codes. And I said, yeah, I don't think that's true. And he said, why? You, th you don't think the language is that good? I said, no, I don't think it's that bad. Because a perfectly logical language is not a human language. Human languages have ambiguity and vagueness. And those things are vital to human language. You couldn't be a politician without those, without ambiguity and vagueness. Ambiguity and vagueness and non-logical properties of human language make them more powerful than logical systems. It's only when we think of languages as logical systems that we think we can study them apart from culture. Languages do have logic. There's no, you know, the French use double negatives. That's not illogical um, in the slightest. But you won't know how to learn, you won't learn how to use double negatives in French until you've been around a lot of French speakers. Uh, and a textbook will not teach you all of the examples. Um, so, so language learning is cultural learning. I have a new article out in Eon Magazine. It's a general article, a general audience article in which I argue that everybody should be a polyglot. Um, and that languages should be obligatory. I mean, a lot of universities have dropped human languages for computer languages because they, they're only thinking of syntax. This is a legacy of the formal linguistics tradition, which is just BS. Uh, human languages require 
infinitely more knowledge, almost literally infinitely more knowledge than computer languages. Not to say computer languages are not important and complicated, but you could learn a computer language in, in a couple of months maybe, maybe even faster. You're not going to learn any human language. Somebody tells me that we have a method for learning a language in 30 days. All of us who've learned a language, that's not true. I don't need to see the evidence. It's not true uh, because language is a cultural artifact. It's a cultural tool for getting across cultural concepts and being able to function culturally. And not all languages um, are the same uh, in, in fundamental ways. Um, you know, people say to me, do you think that this language is inferior because it doesn't have the kinship system we do? I said, do you think you're inferior because you don't play golf? I mean, th these are silly questions. The, the languages have the tools that they want to have based on the cultures the, the cultural needs. If they don't have it, it doesn't meet a cultural need. If it did, they would have it. People, uh, the same thing, if I wanted to play golf, yes, I would need golf clubs. You know, I can't imagine ever being in that circumstance. It, even though I'm at a business university and I'm the only administrator that doesn't play golf, uh, I can't imagine wanting, even wanting to play golf. But if I did want to play golf, I would probably look into some golf clubs. That doesn't mean I'm inferior uh, because I don't have any. If you start to think of language as cultural tools, then um, you realize all languages have evolved to fit their cultural niche and no language therefore is superior to any other language in the world. We're all equal. That doesn't mean we can talk about the same things. It means that we all talk about what we want to talk about. Uh, and uh, not everybody in the Pitaha is really interested in the latest headlines from the Wall Street Journal. They're not going to lose any money on the stocks, unlike me uh, and, and some of us who have retirement funds in university. Um, it's not a concern. They don't talk about it, therefore. Yeah. Well, it's, it's more difficult to show in Peter Ha because he didn't get the kind of intense exposure. I mean, he, when he was there, he, he got it a lot. But he was only there a couple of months a year. But in Portuguese, I can, you know, so when we had been in, the, in Brazil for less than a year, I was invited to give a lecture in Portuguese at my daughter's school. And so I went there and I talked about Brazil's Indians. And afterwards, my daughter said, Papai, tem alguns errinhos no seu português e você vai ter que corrigir. Uh, there's some errors in your Portuguese. So she, you know, and I remember, you know, she was this, she still is this blonde female who to me looks completely American but when when she was playing with her friends I had I had a salesman come to our house in in Brazil and he said Puxa, você é gringo? I said yeah I'm I'm from the States he said but uh, your daughter I was just talking to her and she's Brazilian I said well you know she was raised here and she speaks Portuguese like a Brazilian but uh, so um, I would say that my Portuguese is probably caught up but when we get together the whole family's talking Portuguese more than English. And uh, in fact, that's an interesting thing about code switching. When my kids would come home from school, everything in school happened in Portuguese. It didn't happen in English, so they wouldn't be talking to me in English. It was maybe after dinner sometimes somebody would say something in English, and then the conversation would switch to English. Um, why? Because Portuguese didn't feel the same, and we were describing things that didn't happen in English. Um, and, and that encapsulates, here, here's a simple fact that explains all language and all language variations in the world. You talk like who you talk with. Um, if you're not talking to somebody, you're not going to talk like them. You also think like who you think with. And you eat like who you eat with. So the more we eat like, eat with the same people, talk to the same people, and think with the same people, the less variety there's going to be in our thinking. We need to always be looking to talk with, eat with, think with people unlike ourselves. Because and that doesn't mean in any sort of profound sense, you know. It means as human being to other human being, coming from different cultures and different languages. And I will tell you now that speaking in another language, as everyone in this room knows, uh, you're thinking differently than when you talk in, in English or your native language. So I think I've run over my time, and uh, we're supposed to have coffee or something. So thank you all very much. <laughs>